Okay, so recording has started. Good. Well, welcome everyone. Good evening, everyone. Um, at the uh, Digital Architects Network, uh, we have a interesting session from Mike uh, Wojtan. Wojtan, yes. Wojtan. Uh, yeah, Wojtan. <laughs> And, yeah, hard uh, pronounce it, I know. Mm -hmm. um, about domain-driven designs, and if you ask me, DDD for short, mm -hmm. is a very elegant way to build a very agile enterprise. And one of the beauties is, as Mike will explain, is that you can be very flexible um, trying new things. So uh, without further ado, uh, Mike, uh, let's turn to you. And um, yeah, we, we can ask questions in the chat or, or Mike will ask at certain points in time in the um, in the presentation. Hey, are there any questions? So uh, feel free. Mike, go ahead. Sure. Thank you very much for the introduction. So uh, good evening, everyone. Um, today, this evening, I'm going to show you how you can experiment directly on the domain model without creating costly prototypes and thus creating better domain models and learn faster about your domains by experimenting directly on the domain model. Okay, so let's start with it. Let's start maybe with some story of some project team based on some of my experiences. So imagine we had a great team of very experienced developers that were focused on code quality and good design, followed all of the clean architecture principles, test-driven development, and domain-driven design. They had also quite a great understanding of distributed systems. So we can say they were like masters of the technology and at the same time applied all of the best infrastructure practices. So at the same time, unfortunately, they were not someone I used to call technical business partner. They were, they were great engineers and architects, but without really following all of the business real needs. So how do you think, what was the result of building the project by, by this team? Was it a success? What do you think? So maybe let's go forward. It was That's a disaster, someone mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was a total failure. Yeah, yeah. so uh, they created yet another uh, toy project. That's how it ended up. So we should ask ourselves why. So the main reason is, in my opinion, is that we don't know what we need up front here, yeah? and that's no shame in this. All of us actually don't know. We need to explore it. That's natural. Yeah. And building software is, in fact, all about discovery and learning. And by learning, I mean not only learning new technologies, frameworks, and that kind of things, but learning about your domain, learning about your users, learning about the problems you are solving thanks to your software. This particular team from my story failed because they were learning too slow. So what can we do about it? The answer is obvious. We need to learn faster. But the hard part is what's the best way to learn? So from my experience, it's usually by practicing, by experimenting. Just like the children learn stuff, right? You don't explain quantum physics by theory or something like that. You just give simple everyday examples. And you're explaining more and more complex stuff based on basic examples composed into more and more complex interactions. After all, all of the practical science and engineering is in fact also based on experiments, right? So. Now the question is, can we somehow express this in what we do every day, which is coding? 
So yeah, we can. And what we usually do is we create prototypes. But the problem with prototypes is that, well, even if you're following all of the uh, Lean um, methodologies, if you're running like Lean Startup, for instance, if you're working with startups, then we tend to like create another and another and another prototype, like minimum viable, maybe not product by minimum viable experiment. Yeah, But still the problem with these prototypes is that in fact, you need to create everything to deploy it, including the application layer, including infrastructure, all the Kubernetes stuff, Kafka stuff, brokers, uh, Terraform, you know what I mean, yeah? All of these things which slow you down and ultimately creating prototypes because of this is not the cheapest and fastest way of learning. What I propose instead is to run experiments directly on the domain model. Okay, so during this presentation, we got time only to show greenfield experiments. If you got some more questions after the presentation, we can talk how you can apply experimenting on legacy projects. So let's focus on the greenfield experimenting. And by greenfield experiment, I don't mean only completely new project, but maybe some part of the project, some new module, new feature, yeah, so, something like that. Okay. So um, this diagram is um, showing you how I am trying to build software most of the time. I'll tell you in a moment why I'm telling, trying, yeah, because it's, it's not basically working in every circumstances in every environment. But assuming we are working with people who care, that's how I usually proceed. So. What I do is, oh, sorry. What I do, I usually start with knowledge crunching. And knowledge crunching can be performed using absolutely any way of extracting knowledge you like. In my case, most of the time, that's some form of event storming or iterating uh, through some uh, helps like a product vision board, uh, worldly mapping, and that kind of things. So anyway, knowledge crunching, yeah? For example, even storming. Then after crunching for a while, not for a very long time, I know that you can run storming sessions for like two, three days, but personally from my experience, that doesn't end up well. So after like maybe two, three hours of uh, crunching, you know, knowledge crunching key processes, understanding what we are building, it's usually good to split these processes into some concrete examples. Yeah, because as I mentioned, usually we are learning best by examples, and examples are concrete, right? So since they are concrete, the, there is no misunderstanding when you are explaining something. So. In this step, I usually apply the example mapping technique. I just split parts of the processes into very concrete and simple examples. OK, so what happens next is something I call decode storming. <laughs> That's my term. Probably you can find it on the internet so easily. But basically, the idea is that after having the big picture event storming session and the process level event storming session, you um, sometimes um, use uh, sometimes people jump into something called design level event storming session. And during the design level event storming sessions, we try to answer questions regarding consistency rules, invariants, uh, boundaries of the aggregates, and so on and so forth. Now, the problem is that the, during the design level of storming session, it's too detailed for, for the non-technical uh, uh, non technical participants. So they usually leave the meeting. Um, and they're only developers and, and architects and tech savvy uh, participants left during the, during the sessions. So 
I've been thinking someday. Okay, so if for, at least from my experience, most of the time, if we are just here like designing stuff without re uh, any real business input uh, from non uh, non technical participants, I've been thinking, okay, why not jump straight into the code instead of um, placing stickies over the board? Okay. Um, and then the, the idea of code storming actually came in. So it works like that. You take this example and you express this example as test, right? Example test is almost the same thing if you think about it. So what will be next? We create the very initial model. Yeah? And I'm assuming the Greenfield experiments here, so we got nothing. So practically, uh, an empty project without anything here. So based on this example, we create the very initial model just to satisfy this example. Mm -hmm. Then what we do, we verify and try to challenge the model. Yeah, We try to challenge the model if it will behave correctly in more uh, like maybe a bit more um, complicated scenarios. We can take this one example as an input and split it into a bit more detailed examples if we feel there is a need for this and we want to um, verify and challenge the model to check whether it can like um, express uh, express our real needs. And then we ask others to do the same, to verify the, and challenge the model. Because you see the idea of code storm, since it's a, also a storming right uh, format means we need to do it together so general speaking i am not a huge fan of mob programming but in this case this works really great you are working like three four five engineers on the same examples on the same code base and iterating and iterating and iterating sharing the knowledge refining the model and having very good questions to ask later on. So what do you do next? You refine the model and you again start the loop from the beginning. You take another example, you create another model, verify, challenge, ask others and refine and so on and so forth. So basically test driven development loop, but applied only to the domain model. Okay. so. After some time, if we feel, OK, we produce some meaningful questions or models, because questions are also extremely important, we ask ourselves, OK, is this model good enough? Can we accept it? If we accept this model, we can create the ADR for this architecture decision record, a very simple uh, text document describing the context uh, possible solutions in our decision, usually applied at the architectural level, but in my um, definition, architecture is everything which is important during software development. So definitely also you can think of like architecture the domain model. So uh, uh, that's why I also call it the ADR, right? We want to uh record the decisions record our thinking so if someone joins later on they can know why we made such decisions okay but even if our model is not good enough to say okay we are feeling we are going somewhere but instead uh, we are just left with more questions so if we cannot accept them all yet we still have a very valuable artifacts because we got a lot of questions. So what do you do? You share your findings with business and ask more questions and go back to another crunching session. It can be the same day, can be another day, but no longer than like the next day, especially at the beginning of the Greenfield experiment. Yeah? Later on, uh, it will stabilize. You are not forced to keep interacting uh, with business all that time later on, just at the beginning. Okay, so that's basically how how I work um, with, with, with domain experiments, how I experiment directly on the code. 
in a moment, I'm going to show you a live demo. We're going to start with some examples, and we're going to translate this into code. And we will find some interesting questions and possibly better solutions. But before we get there, uh, are there any questions regarding the, this diagram or anything else? Any questions? OK, so if there are no questions, we will have the questions and answers uh, session after the presentation. OK, so to make it work, the feedback loop, as I mentioned, must be short, especially at the beginning, right? During the Greenfield experiment. So unfortunately, that the reason why I said I'm trying to build software this way is that I'm often jumping between different teams in my work. So I don't always work with the <laughs> most committed teams. So if your team is not ready to learn and is unwilling to challenge the previous de decisions because they're maybe afraid of admiring that, uh, admitting that they did something wrong, then unfortunately, experimenting one way like this. Yeah. I if, even more, you shouldn't even try with it. Just do your stuff as you usually do. Because uh, experimenting like that will only waste your time. It can lead to a lot of frustrations. So you need to have a short feedback loop and work with people who care. OK, so maybe just to summarize why the core of this experiment is the example mapping. As I mentioned, there is no other way, in my opinion, to learn than by examples. Examples help us to clarify the requirements, yeah? because you can always write very abstract text and it won't mean anything unless you chop it into concrete examples. And thanks to examples, we can understand what we really need, because maybe initial requirements were flawed. Yeah? And by chopping it into examples, we can have better and better understanding over the details, which can lead us to have um, more and more knowledge about our domain. And thus, maybe we'll have some um, findings uh, regarding what is really needed to solve the problems of our clients. OK, so now when you combine the example mapping with the test room development, effectively leading to the code storming, which is part of the uh, domain experiment, then you get something really awesome. And I'd like to show you how it looks in practice. So there is the repository you can clone later on. It's publicly available on my GitHub. Um, but now we will go together through all of these examples. OK, so let's go to the first step of domain uh, experiments, which is knowledge crunching. I'll switch to mirror now. OK, cool. So imagine we are working on a project, which is called the crowd sorcery. Crowd sorcery, basically, is a crowdfunding platform supporting passive investments. So a tool which allows investors just to deposit some money, just to make some deposits, set up some automated strategies where this money should be invested in. And when there is a new opportunity, a new project that uh, according to the strategies then our platform should invest in, then it all happens in the background. I mean, no active investment uh, is, is needed. And this is a huge gain because, well, uh, active investing requires a lot of time, right? And investors usually don't have as much time. Yeah? They prefer to keep earning money instead of just searching for the opportunities. So in the crowdsourcery, we're going to start with 
first stage of event storming, which is called the big picture storming session. Naturally, this is a very simplified example. Yeah, we would have like 10 more of such events happening here, but um, maybe let me let me start for, for, from the example of the big picture in case maybe um, you haven't used it yet. So uh, first of all, it's a collaborative uh, way of exploring the domain. So we all, including business, including engineers, including architects, testers, uh, product owners, business analysts, are gathered in the same room, either physical or virtual nowadays. Um, and the facilitator just asks everyone to place some green stickers, which are facts or events happening in our stories. So basically, there are like the, uh, like tens of of such stickers after a very short time, sometimes even over a hundred. Everyone just placing everything which is in, in his head. So such events might be, for instance, project funded. It can be duplicated. That's quite natural because that's this chaotic part of the exploration. Investment made, project defaulted, funds received, deposit made, funds withdrawn, interest paid, project paid, schedule accepted, payment not received on time, project canceled, project started, were registered, and investor registered. Finally, project repaid. As you can see, it's not ordered. Yeah, it's it's this chaotic world. Everyone just puts something on the board. Okay. So the next step of uh, storming sessions is to actually find the key processes happening in these stories. So we need to first order them, and then try to make um a cohesive narration yeah? thus creating the foundations for for, for for the key processes uh there are different tools you can use different approaches you can use to to find the meaningful uh stories for example uh, pivotal events uh but it's not part of this presentation let's just imagine we found out these processes so we found out there are two main processes happening here. The first one is called the fundraising, and the second one is called investing. As you can imagine, fundraising is from the perspective of the borrower. The borrower is someone who borrows the money for uh, her project. And investing is naturally from the perspective of the investor. So fundraising might look like this. Borrower is first registered. OK, then the schedule is accepted and by schedule i mean the schedule of the project uh when uh, do they want to receive money and so on and so forth afterwards the project can be started and after project is started project can be cancelled or funds can be received multiple times that will eventually lead to project being funded so that's a very simple story of the fundraising process. Now, from the investor perspective, it looks a bit different. Investor is also registered, but then deposit is made, then investment is made, and project is funded after some time. And now, uh, interest can be paid for the investor. If it happens multiple times, then project is finally repaid and funds can be withdrawn okay but payment might not be received on time from the i mean the borrower might not uh, repay uh, the next uh, rate for instance the next uh, the next interest and in such case the project might eventually be defaulted yeah but defaulted i mean they are not ready they, they are not able to pay it on time yeah Okay, and um, then some funds can also be withdrawn, even in this case, because well, uh, we keep some deposits, say because uh, deposits as a, as a platform. But uh, naturally, if we keep digging 
deeper here that would be a lot more relationships between all of these events right so let's just uh let's just um focus on, on fundraising and investing asset days fair enough okay and now let's zoom in into the fundraising and maybe let's start at the initial part of it which is starting a project or fundraising a project yeah um just bootstrapping it out on our platform so here we got the example mapping session example mapping is extremely simple you just take some part of your process for example starting a project yeah we are not interested here in like receiving funds and funding the project just starting the uh, starting the fundraising and we focus just on this use case for example starting a project there can be more use cases as you can see like canceling a project receiving the funds funding project making deposit paying interest repaying project and a lot more but during the presentation we will focus on starting a project use case so in the example mapping what you do you try to express this part of, of the process this 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 use case here with some very very simple <laughs> examples uh, sometimes people um, prefer to put some rules on top of it like for example, only verified borrowers are allowed to start a project or project must be verified and then they uh, chop it into more examples. However, uh, most of the time I just start with some examples without writing the rules yet because I don't know the rules. I, I need to uh, discover them. I, I might have some very vague uh, like uh, uh, vision of what we are building but that's all yeah so I, I prefer to start with some examples and then try to extract the rules out of them okay so maybe let's start with this case about having only verified borrowers and that only verified borrowers can actually start the project so here we got two examples the first one is when the one where adult borrower starts a project in example mapping, we usually read it like this the one where adult borrower starts a project and the one where borrower without criminal record starts a project naturally these are just initial examples as you will see we will find more and more examples when we start working on them but what we have now is good enough for us to start the code storming session. And now we're gonna go to some live coding. Okay, so I get the practically empty examples for uh, uh, empty project for you here. Uh, there is just a Spring Boot application bootstrapped without anything here, just the main class. And that's everything, yeah. And um, what I have created for you already is the example mapping test. Okay, so I usually do something like that. I write, okay, some examples taken from the mirror session. Then I like to give a link to the session okay on 2023 uh, 11 13 yeah something like that okay so these are just some examples taken from uh, based on our crunching uh sessions mirror so what i do next i take this example i can even try to copy it let's see if that works yeah it works okay cool so let's create the first example the first test adult borrower starts the project okay cool. 
Okay, so we got nothing. Very vague description of it. So we need to start with something, right? And since we got no domain model yet, it's time to start building the foundations of the ubiquitous language and of the domain model. So since we want to have the other borrower, I'll do exactly that. I'll try to create a borrower. We don't have such a type here, so we need to create it. What I do, I simply ask my IntelliJ to create it for me. Okay, and let's instantiate it. Cool. Now, when we have uh, this, this borrower, we need to start a project somehow. We don't know what are the boundaries of our systems yet. We don't know what uh, type of building block will actually accept it, whether it would be aggregate or domain service or maybe something, some application service. We don't know it yet. So let me just call it a system. Like maybe some system to start the fundraising. I don't know the banner name. And actually what I am doing here, I am following the, the gibberish game by Greg Young. I am not trying to name stuff, just given something which doesn't <laughs> maybe represent everything, uh, how it's really happens in, uh, happen in business. But let's start with something. Okay, and let's create it again. There is some system to start the fundraising. Also, we got some system. So we need to have it yeah, that just the natural stuff here, nothing special. We got the system. And now this system must be able to accept the start fundraising command. So maybe let's name it like that, start the fundraising. Okay. There is no such a method, so I'm creating it. Okay. And now it's time to actually start thinking how we can model this assertion part. Yeah. Start fundraising. Mm, that's something. I mean, introduces some action to the system, performs something. Yeah, I start, start starting should should actually start uh, the fundraising for the given borrower. Um. So what I do now, I try to stick very very close to our model from the storming part of it. So. What I do, I try to model every behavior of my system by events, because I believe that's the closest to our initial source of inspiration here on, on the board. There are multiple ways how we can do this. So we need to make some simple decision right now. And my decision would be to make it as simple as possible and simply return the events. So what I usually do, I do something like that. You can do it any other way. You can iterate. It's not important because you are experimenting. So it's very cheap to change, right? My first assumption is that system is like, in, in fact, if I will be writing this in like in Kotlin, for instance, instead of Java, I would just probably create a function because it, it, it's just the way for me to like start the fundraising with some input. And then I can say that this is a very simple function, just returning the events produced by the business logic. So what I do next, I again create these domain events. And I change the start fundraising. And I change uh, the start fundraising to return this domain events. I believe these domain events were placed in the test here. So let's move. Uh, yeah, exactly. I can. Okay, and uh, let's make it fundraising. Cool. Okay, so since we have the domain events now, all we have to do is to assert that this domain events, uh, that that um, uh, fundraising actually started. Yeah. So here it's named project started. Probably name fundraising started would be better. But let's start with project started. So what I would do now, I would say that I want these events 
to have at, uh, to have at least one um, event of type project start that happened. We can express it, for instance, by adding some metadata to main events. Uh, has occurred something like that. Um, project started. Okay. Cool. So let's create a method. Okay. And let's create the event. Cool. Okay. So now this event most probably would be the domain event. So I am usually introducing some kind of like market interface for this. Okay. And this should return a boolean, like project has started. Okay, so let's return. Okay, cool. And let's assert this timeline. Sessions, from maybe from muscle J is true. Yeah, cool. Okay, and we should have an executable part of code. Let's try to run it. Naturally, it doesn't pass because our implementation is just the draft implementation here, right? Star fundraising always return empty domain event, null instead of domain events. So instead, we should return something like something like that. Okay. Cool. Okay. Okay. Cool. And maybe let's expose it as a list of some domain events, just like that. Events. Cool. Maybe events list. Okay. And here let's create. Okay, yes, something like that. Something like that. And here we can just check that event list uh, stream uh, or any, match, uh, any matches. Something like that. Okay. Cool. So let's try to run it again. Okay, and this time the tests pass. So uh, naturally, there are no any rules yet, right? So as you can see, since we are following the test during development approach here, we create very naive models. This model doesn't represent any rules yet. It's here just for one reason, to start building the foundation of the ubiquitous language, which is the language shared in code, documentation, business talks, and practically everywhere inside the same context. So we started from nothing and we produced some pieces of this story. But to make it a val valuable piece of software expressing some projects, even if we are iterating just on the domain model, we need to have some real rules and real behaviors. So now, since I showed you what's the approach, the initial approach to, to, to the code storming part, uh, I'll just switch to another comments and show you the uh, evolution of uh, evolution of, the, of this uh, of these examples. Okay, cool. So let's clean all of this and let's go to next commit. Okay, so basically, that's exactly what you've uh, seen so far. That's uh, the same example given all the world where once the project and project is started successfully. As you can see, interesting part of it is that in our very initial model, there is no notion of being adult or not. It's just any borrower here. So that's the first thing we see. OK, mm, yeah, uh, this model doesn't make sense. Yeah, naturally, because that's a very initial model. We need to iterate. 
So let's switch to another one. Let's go to another iteration of the model. Okay, and now this time we actually we actually have two cases. Given Albert when Burr wants to approach the project to start successfully, and this time when I'm creating the yellow borrower, I'm given DH here. Yeah, naturally this is wrong here. <laughs> we shouldn't be passing H and updating H all the time. That's extremely naive, but I'm showing you it's so cheap that we can make very dumb decisions uh, and it's not a problem at all, right? We can just change it very, very soon. So um, that's this first case about the adult test. I won't be running all of them. This test should be passing, but it's not important for you at this stage. So let's just go through the examples. And there is another example, yeah? 17 years old. Given Brower who is 17 years old, when Brower wants to start a project, then the project is not started. Okay. So we are creating the Brower of age of 17 years, and then Brower wants to start a project. And here is just the execution of something I called the uh, start project comment handler, yeah, which is something I previously called some system to start fundraising. And I just uh, execute the command start project by. And now, this is actually the first case where we are adding the first bit. Yeah, because there is a very, very simple rule. There is first rule here. And now I am not just returning how many events of project started as I did previously in the first iteration, but I add the first if check. If can accept this borrower. And then we just check whether the borrower is adult. And that's all. Extremely simple. But important moment. We started thinking about the behaviors, about the roles, not just writing the foundations of, of, of the language. OK, so let's go to another step. Let's go to step number two. So. Um, we can be more specific about it, right? So as you can see, these, these, these examples, even if they're just based on this very, very simple uh, example from the example mapping, are becoming more and more concrete. Yeah, all over where when started and first started successfully, we know it already. And then at the next stage, we decided to introduce the permit race test. So given a borrower who is younger than 18 years old when a borrower wants to start a project, then project is not started. Yeah. And then instead of just hard coding 17, we say like 17, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1 here in the value source. Yeah. And in such a case, when this borrower wants to start a project, uh, since she's not at all, no events should occur. Nothing should happen in our system. We could add like some rejection or something like that, but let's keep it simple for now. Okay. So in the yet another step, we make a simple refinement of our borrower class. Because as you can see, now we took a look at this and we found out that, okay, we, we just placed some H that was very naive here. Yeah? Instead of keeping the H, we would like to keep, uh, we would like to have the perfect here. Uh, and there is no problem, no problem at all, because, well, we, we can still operate on a very, very simple domain model. Uh, and we can just create some current date for the needs of the test and uh, treat it as a point zero in time and then simply pass the fixed clock uh, to the uh, command handler uh, that uh, always returns uh, the current the current date and then we can give all of the uh, birth dates in uh, relation to the, to the current date like minus years or something like that yeah okay so just a simple improvement over the model but now, if we take a look at these examples, there is one thing 
Mm, that should be kind of puzzling for you already. So we are dealing with money. Yeah? We are dealing with investition, uh, with investments, serious stuff. Mm -hmm. Probably we, we should. Now, now the question is, should we even allow uh, to have non-adults in our platform? I mean, yeah, we introduced some simple rules regarding starting the project and then checking the age. But now, okay, um, yeah, that's that's the moment when we might start thinking just by looking at this code. It, our system actually allows to uh, assumes that we can have non-adults, yeah, because there is some if. Cool, but probably we shouldn't even allow such accounts on our platform. So. In step number four is actually kind of important because that's the first breakthrough. And the breakthrough is that we don't need to check the age of the borrower. We simply don't allow registering borrowers who are younger than 18 years old, and it's all. So let's check out the NRA comment and take a look at the changes. So now, the previous example is change it just to like that. Given borrower, when borrower wants to start a project and project starts successfully. So now at this point, our system allows anyone to start a project. So we assume that everyone is uh, eligible to, to use our platform. Uh, naturally, it, it, it doesn't make really sense yeah, to, to have such a system. So if it occurs that there are no more rules regarding this, I wouldn't even create any kind of system. Yeah, just start and accept it always, not even call it a system or anything like that. Yeah. And naturally, that wouldn't happen on uh, in real project. So we're going to get back to this in a moment. But now let's take a look at another scenarios. This another scenarios are grouped as a nested test called the new borrower registers. So if we run our test now, you can see in the reports here that we basically have like two, two scenarios here, starting a project and new parallel registers. And this is not scenario taken from the mirror board. This is not taken from example mapping. This is actually the result of iterating on our domain model. This is our finding. So we created another scenario, new borrower registers. And here we have a very simple cases, like only a little borrower can register their accounts. Yeah. And now naturally we start with a parameterized test already. Yeah. Just give some like uh, the birth date and the now date, now date, now, 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 and the birth date. Okay. So, uh, this is uh, uh, in this case, uh, all of these borrowers are considered uh, adults. So instead of having uh, some system to accept the registration yet, I've tried to express this on a type level. So you cannot even you cannot even create the borrower who is not adult. That's on the type level. OK, probably we will need some uh, registration system in a moment, but that's our first approach. I mean, uh, the registration system would still use the same type, uh, but probably we'll have more rules than just about the age. But it makes sense to to add it on the on the to add it uh, on uh, on the type level as well. OK, and naturally, the other cases when the given birth date and current date, then this borrower is not allowed to register her account because she's, uh, she's, she's not at all. Yeah? In such a case, uh, when we try to construct the borrower, there is some illegal argument exception that's being thrown. OK, so that's our first breakthrough, just by iterating over a model. And if we go back to uh, our stalling 
uh, sessions um, strictly to our example mapping session here. Then we can safely update it by saying, OK, we have new findings. We will have more questions. Probably it doesn't make sense to express this rule here. Instead, we introduced a new use case, new for our registers. And in such a case, we say, if greater or equal to 18 years old, then it's fine. Otherwise, uh, it's rejected. OK, so it's just by looking at code. Yeah. And now let's go to another example. The borrower without criminal record starts a project. So let's go back to the code again. And let's move it here. Here. Um, maybe I'll just clear it here. Cool. Right. Okay. So in such a case, we are still in the new borrower registers scenarios yeah here and the reason is because it's we apply the same way of thinking do we want to have criminals on our platform probably not right so instead of going the same way around again we immediately added a new case a new example person with criminal record cannot register her account and that's all yeah so in such a case there is some rule so probably there must be some system and this is the moment when i introduce the concept of the borrower registry yeah i named it like this i thought it might be a good name for it but we would need to uh, consult it with our domain experts naturally um but sounds okay for me uh i think i am right here so that's why i'm not applying the gibberish game this time okay so i get something which is called the borrower registry which is a system which allows us to register borrowers based on some register form registration form here yeah uh, okay and what about the criminal record so as you can imagine criminal record probably is not a simple boolean right the, it must involve using some strategy, some policy, some uh, rules that can be easily changed later on because it might get complex over time. We should feel it. So that's why I decided in, the, in, in this iteration of the model to create a concept of criminal record okay and what's a criminal record here so basically criminal record is a very simple strategy or policy interface yeah just answer the question whether this this uh this person has criminal record yeah and returning volume that's all so since this will evolve heavily as we assume that's why i decided to use the policy as a building work here and that's why and that's why it's expressed like this that's why this strategy is passed as an argument to the criminal record aware borrower registry borrower registry is just a very simple interface here that allows us to register um borrowers based on the registration form and we are using the implementation called criminal record aware borrower registry which implements this rule regarding that if criminal if if um borrower has a criminal record then uh we uh, throw the borrower registry exception because we cannot allow uh criminals to register accounts on our platform 
Okay, and then we'll just uh, catch the exception here and assert that this exception is, is not null. And that, that would be all for, for this rule. Uh, okay. Um, so, again, this somehow changes the way how we are operating, um, how we are expressing things on our on our board, right? So again, I remove the borrower without criminal record, search the project example from starting the, the project uh, use case here. Instead, move it here again. So I added person with criminal record tries to register to the new borrower registers use case. So it might be a good idea at the beginnings of the project to actually include our findings on board. So we are iterating on the code and then adding our questions or assumptions or doubts directly to the uh, whiteboard. To, for example, to mirror, right? As I'm using it here. Um, yeah, and, and, and the reason is because very soon we're gonna go back with our doubts questions like the latest next day. Uh, at the beginning of the project to talk again with domain experts, business analysts, and so on and so forth. As you can see, there is also the new concept, borrower registry, which we introduced as a new definition based on our code, which I assumed that is a good name for it. But uh, it's usually a good idea to ask about it, you know, um, whether we are on the same track. That's why I also placed it here. Okay. So, this leads us to actually going into this rule. Project must be verified first. Yeah, as you can see, only verified borrowers are allowed to start. It doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah, so we can just drop it and let's just focus on project must be verified instead. So uh, we got a few few examples here, like okay, when less than ten thousand dollars, or need to be verified manually when. Uh, greater or equal to ten thousand uh, dollars, the one with the schedule is accepted, and the one that schedule is not accepted. I mean, like the repayment schedule. Yeah. So, like a few examples here, and let's start with this one again. Okay, one less than ten thousand dollars. So, uh, let's move to the next iteration. Cool. So this time. Starting a project is not about verifying just whether our uh, borrowers can uh, like start the project because it's already being checked at the borrower register level, right? When when creating the account or registering uh, on our platform. So this time, the check the rules regarding uh, the the proposal value, the total goal. Of the proposal of the, of the project is included in our fundraising system. So that's why here, in the case starting a project, we have added more examples. The first one is given project proposal of 9,000 total value when borrower wants to start a project based on this proposal, then project is started successfully immediately because it's less than $10,000, right? Okay. So again, new borrower, and then we want borrower wants to start a project. And here, I am just using some project proposal created here with 5,000 USD. Yeah. Uh, as you can see, I've used 5,000, but it should be 9,000 here. <laughs> so sorry for that. Okay. Uh, here, another one. Given a project proposal of 10,000 dollar value. When borrower wants to start a project based on this proposal, then project needs to be verified first. And by verified first, I mean like the manual verification by someone else, uh, on our platform. Okay. So in such a case, when we are creating the project proposal, which is the input for our fundraising system, then we simply say that, okay, it's a value $10,000 here. Yeah. Project proposal of total value yeah, using helper method mother object and then we again start a project based on this proposal and in such a case there is one event 
of type project request accepted for verification. Okay, so uh, that's uh, that's about uh, these two rules. If, when it's okay, when less than thousand dollars, and when it's more than or equal to ten thousand dollars. We are not covering the schedules, so there are schedules index of the examples uh, here. As we are getting close to the end of the presentation, I believe that's uh, that's that's enough uh, for, for for the for the introduction. Um, but maybe uh, let's go to the last commit here to see the to see the final version of it. Okay, check out. Cool. And the final the final version might look like that. First of all, we have split it into two scenarios, funding the project and managing the project. Funding a project is from the investor perspective. We have not covered this during the presentation, but there was a process about investing, so probably it will be also included uh, after the first day of iterations, or at least some very simple draft of it. And that's how our examples regarding uh starting a project and a registering borrower looks like so nothing changed here here uh, we are uh, checking the registration stuff um we have introduced the concept of the project proposal for the needs of checking the total value of the of the project for checking whether we can accept this proposal to start the fundraising. Uh, and again, I use the name project proposal because it uh, just sounds right to me, but uh, we should always uh, verify whether we are using uh, the terms which are understandable by both business and engineers. Uh, okay, so. So, so Mike. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm trying to get a, a grip on it. <laughs> um, so are you suggesting that there is an existing domain using ubiquitous language, there's existing code, and using your approach, you can actually uh, add additional functions? Um, Lively? I I mean, uh, the ubiquitous language is like mm, sh should be created uh, together. Um, but if we are sure, working, but on is, it, is the domain already existing? Uh, this concrete domain we are currently working on, mm -hmm. uh, not exactly in the same form. Because uh, I, I I cannot see the advantage between what you're doing now and a uh, a prototype. Uh, the difference is that I am iterating in a very short iterations on the domain model, which is extremely cheap. And I am expressing the key processes, the behaviors. Mm -hmm. We can have then like very, very simple view over it and not like, uh, and not discover the rules, not discover. Uh, but where, the do, right where do you execute it? Because if you have a prototype, Mm -hmm. and you have an iteration and you want to learn mm -hmm. for that and mm -hmm. create prototype number two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where do you execute this code then? If you uh, have so, some short iterations. Yes. So for now, I just start with uh, tests and the examples and I go back to the storming session to find out more regarding our doubts. So what we are doing here, we are doing it for like better understanding of what we are, what we want to build. And after like maybe week or two weeks, it, there is no problem to like create, for instance, in memory implementation of the repository or like very, very simple view, expose it anywhere uh, and allow our users to, to click over it. But this time there would be some processes being implemented in. So instead of following the traditional way where you first build mockups, and you start with forms which doesn't really convey any business uh, knowledge, uh, any 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 domain knowledge. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and then you try to like fill in the handlers for the buttons. Instead of that, we go the other way. We go from the heart of our software, from real problems. And we try to ask all of the meaningful and hard to answer uh, questions at the very beginning, at the very, very beginning of the project. And then we create some mockups, uh, some databases. Then we know what to choose. I mean, what architecture is best based, based on our needs, based on our business drivers. So we start with this, but like after two weeks, I can expose you a clickable application. That's not a problem, right? Uh, but I, I simply started with a very uh, with, with processes because I believe that's what's really in the heart uh, of the software. I want to understand the complexities. I want to understand what problems we are solving. I want to understand what are the right business drivers now and not like after six months of development. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, finally, uh, it might look something like this. Yeah. The next iteration of the Stolmy might um, look something like that. That uh, there's a rule about verification of the project. There might be some events added here, like project started or project proposal accepted for verification. This event hasn't been here in the first iteration of the big picture session, yeah. Um, but it came out that when we started thinking about roles, uh, we asked ourselves, okay, what would happen when the value of the project is very big? I don't know if it's 10,000 or it's according to some strategy. Maybe we should use some strategy, maybe some thresholds, maybe it should be like a bit more configurable. But these are again the questions we should ask. But probably we shouldn't accept anything, right? So that's why we introduced the concept of like maybe project proposal accepted for verification, but we need to ask how verification works. Yeah. We need to ask this during the next next session. We also found out some possible definitions we might ask about later on, like project proposal, project proposal supervisor, someone who checks whether we can accept it. Uh, maybe the, the right name is exactly that project proposal supervisor instead of start fundraising system. And we already created, well, quite a lot of quite a lot of domain, uh, domain classes here after a very, very short time. And, mm -hmm. uh, with having quite a lot of understanding, uh, as you can see here. I can introduce all of the other parts here. We just touched the domain model because it's experimenting on the domain model, but we can have use cases, application services, which simply delegate to some project proposal supervisor, the one which checks whether we can start the project or not, like the automated supervisor, right? Uh, and then there can be also the adapter for it, like. For instance, the command line adapter, which simply delegates the start project use case that it could be REST adapter, it could be gRPC adapter, I don't care about it, right? And also some infrastructure stuff. For example, the in-memory borrower repository uh, or some uh, managing project spring counting here, like definition of all the bins and all that stuff. So we started with this and all of the use cases, infrastructure, adapters, and anything just is a wrapper around our processes expressed and modeled in our domain model. Okay. We have another question, uh, Mike. Yeah, sure. Um, so maybe, Harry, uh, you, you can explain yourself, but um, it's in the chat box. Uh, okay, just, ask, yeah. just give me a moment. I'll take a look at this. Uh, the chat box question. So where is the experiment part? Have not seen an experiment that could fail or succeed. Uh, or is the experiment for you that you start with what you have now? So um, the experiment is the next iteration of my domain model. I mean, it can be very bad and we can drop it so uh that's that's how this this can actually fail that's the moment when we say okay our model is not good enough 
because it won't be able, for instance, to express all of our requirements. Or maybe it's not good enough because it won't satisfy some changing part of our system, like some policy of uh, accepting uh, accepting the fundraising. Um, okay. and, yeah. Yeah. My, my, my question is more um, mm -hmm. about, um, let's say, good experiments have uh, about a 50-50 chance to mm -hmm. fail or succeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, what what actions do you take to to get to such an amount before you start uh, uh, TDDing your your uh, your domain model? So I, I did not see anything you just started there. That that was my question about uh, experiments because I I have a very fixed idea about mm -hmm. experiments. So okay. Uh, so you mean like a bit more scientific approach to this, right? <laughs> um, um, so we can actually uh, measure it and start with something. So it, in in my understanding, experiment uh, is just another like iteration. I, I I don't assume whether it will succeed or fail. I just check whether it matches all of our needs. So. I'm not uh, like using any full blown like scientific approach for this. Yeah, uh, I just I just try to express it, check whether it works. If it works, that's cool. If not, I I uh, I try something else. So so that's my approach for this. Okay, but when your requirements would be perfect, you would just iterate. No, 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 no. The requirements and you would never. Uh, there, there is there is no chance for requirements to be ready. I, I actually I don't really like uh, the term requirements. Uh, frankly, I, I hate it. I mean, uh, there is no such a thing of requirement. It would assume that there is some kind of oracle that can tell us what's right and what's wrong. That's not how the world works. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, our clients have some problems. We need to understand these problems to help them understand what they really need. So mm -hmm. we produce first version of the model and we ask them, OK, uh, so our model now can solve. We don't name it model. Our system now uh, can uh, like uh, solve this problem, this example and this example. OK, is it good enough for you for this iteration of the application for the first version of it, for instance? Would it be ready if if we released it like this? Would it be ready to actually put it on the first cycle of um, feedback loop? If it's good enough, then we can create it like that, deploy it, and see how the world reacts, right? And then we gain more knowledge over it. So basically, I am experimenting to better understand our needs. Probably we would iterate like. 20 times, 30 times, 50 times before we get to any conclusion. Uh, so most of it would be actually like dropped at some point of, of this code. But we still have a lot of questions, which is, ex and in my opinion, that's one of the cheapest way of actually exploring it. Yeah. Uh, and and ha having, having this question. So, so, so that, that's okay. the rationale yeah. behind it. That's that's fair. Okay. Uh, I, I have another question. Um, mm -hmm. You you used TDD here um, yeah. um, to find out that you only want to register adult programmers, and um, of course you could use TDD for that. But yeah, yeah. You, you could also uh, have taken five minutes longer <laughs> in your example mapping or. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm I'm curious because I I think you are convinced that this actually adds something. So mm -hmm. what what is the secret sauce yeah. that makes this this better than spending more time? So, in, in, uh, yeah. Uh, so naturally, uh, these examples for the needs of the presentation uh, are simplified. Yeah. So. Uh, you, uh, if you have any knowledge uh, about the archetypes, uh, then that's obvious, as you say, right? Uh, if you're just a, at least a bit experienced engineer, seen some systems, 
yes, in such a case, that's obvious, right? Uh, I just mm -hmm. wanted to show you the way of, of, of doing the experiments. What yeah. I am doing, I am using it when domain is a bit more complex than that, and I don't understand it yet. I, uh, I, for example, when I don't even know what questions I should ask. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, that's my approach. Uh, for example, I, I, I've been um, uh, working on a system, on a video system, uh, where interactions between uh, participants uh, in, in these video systems were extremely important, like whether uh, you said something which amused others, uh, whether this room uh, is actually full of laughing people, and maybe there are some other rooms which should attract others based on some rules and so on and so forth. I mean, there, would, there were a lot of rules, and naturally, uh, since it was just a vision of the rules because uh, of, of the founder of it, uh, we, we needed somehow um, to think about all of the edge cases and ask more meaningful questions. And what I did, I did exactly that, right? I, I started giving examples and telling you, okay, so if it behaves like that, what will, should we do? This or that, this or that, this or that, yeah? And based on the results, I decided, okay, my model is not good enough. I'll drop it. Or, or okay, we are getting somewhere. Yeah, we are getting somewhere. Uh, so uh, that's that's how, how I use it. So uh, I use experimenting like that when I am not sure. And actually, in almost every, every project I have built, I, I had some doubts, right? Uh, so you can say you can apply it everywhere in at least some part of the system if you are walking with people who care. That's the requirement. That's the real requirement. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's also your another question. Okay. Uh, here. Yeah. Do yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there is also. Thank. Uh, yeah. Okay. We're Not running. Yeah, we're running almost out of time. I don't know whether there are more questions to ask for Mike. So, so if if there are no more questions mm -hmm. for now, then thank you. Um, thank you very much for it. If if if, if you're for inviting me. Well, thank if you, it, Mike, for uh, taking us, uh, how you call it, down the rabbit hole of domain-driven design. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I noticed you need some basic concepts of DDD. Otherwise, you you won't get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, like uh, event storming, domain mapping, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, just, just, but just at a very basic level, actually, to start with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, anyway, if if you liked it, uh, you can you can check out my website uh, or just contact me, uh, send me a message, drop me a line, uh, or just connect on on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah. I'll be sharing uh, the PDF version of the presentation after the talk. Uh, okay. So I'll ask you, uh, Peter, to propagate it later. Uh, I will do. In... I will do. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we are we are recording this, and this will be put on uh, YouTube. So. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Sorry? Thank you I'm, very I'm, much. Go ahead. I'm, I'm uh, final question. I was looking for information about code storming on your website, but could not find it. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, I, I have not included it on my website yet. That's part of uh, one of the trainings I am offering on my website. Um, but if you uh, if you type domain experiments, uh, then you, you will find a lot uh, other talks uh, on other okay. conferences here. Thank you. Thank you. OK, well, Mike, thanks a lot. And uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you again. Um, OK, so please send me the PDF. I will propagate it. And uh, everybody knows you can email Mike if you have any more questions. So uh, yeah. thanks a sure. lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. OK, thank you. OK, Bye -bye. Bye. thank you. Bye.